are God's building. So we have these multiple levels of sanctuaries. What is it then that defiles the sanctuaries? What is it that defiles the sanctuary? What does it need to be cleansed from? Sin? Okay. Now remember it says here, even so the mighty cleaver of truth is taking people out of the quarry of the world. What does that have to do with sin? What does it have to do with sin? What does truth have to do with sin? How has Lucifer and Satan, the devil, how has he gotten people to sin? To rebel against God? How has he done that? What? Deceit. Deceit. Exactly. Lies. He's lied about the character of God. How did he get the angels to fall? He lied about the character of God. How did he get Adam and Eve to fall? He questioned and lied about the character of God. It happens every time. That's how he does it. That is his method. God can only counteract lies with the truth. And when you have two sides, you know, eventually the truth may come out. In God's case, it will. In God's case, it will. It's not just about good and evil. This is about truth and lies. If it was only about good and evil, God would have done away with this along. We wouldn't be going through all of this. It'd be over, because God is more powerful. This is about truth and error, truth and lies. This is why we're the great controversies. The great controversy is not about good and evil. It is about truth and and lies. And it is about the character of God. It is not about us. It is not about our salvation. Our salvation is dependent on our understanding and knowing the true character of God. But that's secondary. Our salvation is not the primary thing going on in this universe. But through it, God is revealing the truth about himself to the rest of the universe. And Satan is revealing the truth about himself to the universe. So, what defiles the sanctuary? First of all, lies. The lies about God defile the sanctuary. The lies then cause rebellion, lawlessness, unbelief. and that and unbelief. Okay. From the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character and to excite rebellion against his law. And this work appears to be done with us. You go back and read through um, Ezekiel on how it describes Lucifer. And um, Lu- Satan, the angel formerly known as Lucifer, occupied the position of covering cherub. You know, when you think of that, he occupied the position of covering cherub. What do you think of? Closest to God. Closest to God. You think of the most holy place and the ark. The covering cherub, the ark, above the mercy seat was the Shekinah glory, and there was two covering cherubs. That was where Lucifer was. He was a covering cherub. He was in the most holy place, in the sanctuary, in heaven. Heaven was, was defiled. The place where God dwelt was defiled by Lucifer, not by us. So, so far, you know, the 
sanctuary, the cleansing of heaven? Is the cleansing of the sanctuary the cleansing of heaven? The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is the cleansing of heaven, yes. Well, you said the sanctuary was heaven. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple sanctuaries. Oh. But yes, the heavenly sanctuary needed cleansing because where did rebellion first start? In heaven. And when, when, if, when ultimately, well, well, when was the heavenly sanctuary cleansed? When do you think? Hmm? When, they cast Lucifer. when they cast Lucifer out. Do you think? That didn't remove the doubt. What? That didn't remove the questions. That didn't remove the questions, okay? When do you think the questions were removed? When Jesus died. When Jesus died. In essence, the heavenly sanctuary was cleansed when Jesus died. At that point, Satan was so totally revealed in his character and his enmity against Christ that he no longer had the sympathies of the heavenly host. That was it. He was finished. As far as heaven was concerned. Christ cleansed the heavenly sanctuary when he died. But he goes on to talk about Lucifer, and I never had seen this before. In Ezekiel, it talks about, you were the anointed uh, guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were in the holy mount of God and walked among the fiery stones, and you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. And it just goes on and on. And in the end it goes, your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor, so I threw you to the earth. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. I'd never remembered that part of the whole thing, that sanctuaries was in here too. Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of the angels when he knew nothing of what it meant himself and when he would not himself make any self-sacrifice for others. This was the accusation that Satan made against God in heaven. And how did God answer that? How did God answer that? He came to this earth and lived under the same conditions he required of his creatures. That's the beauty of this Christmas season. God answered that charge. Oh, you just want these people, you know, just to bow down to you, worship you, do everything you want them to do. God came himself and lived under the same conditions and requirements that he asked of his creatures. Um, there's lots of stuff we could go into, but we need to... Um, But you need to understand about this whole concept of sanctuary. What cleanses the sanctuary? Let's get into that. What cleanses the sanctuary? What defiled the sanctuary? Sin, and what else? Lies, okay? Get this firmly in your head. The great controversy is about truth and lies. At the, at the basis of sin is lies. Belief in lies. If you believe the lies, it's true for you. And you behave and you react accordingly. That's why Jesus said, I've come to give you the truth and this truth will set you free. So what desecrates the sanctuary is lies and ultimately the sins of the result of those lies. How is the sanctuary cleansed? It's just the opposite. It's cleansed with truth 
and is cleansed with righteousness. Who has that? Who has truth and righteousness? Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ that cleanses the sanctuary. That's why, how did they cleanse the earthly sanctuary? How did they make holy or sanctify the earthly sanctuary? What did they do before they burnt the lamb? The sacrifice was slain. What did they do with it? Put it on the altar, but what did they do? They collected blood. Remember, this is the other symbol that you need to remember. The blood is the life. Because the life is in the blood. Blood represents life. That blood was sprinkled around the altar. It was taken into the sanctuary, sprinkled there. On the Day of Atonement, it was taken into the most holy place and sprinkled there. That represented the life of Christ. That's what cleanses. The way to the Father is through Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way that you will be reconciled, that we will come back to God. Because he told us the truth about God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Hebrews, which we were supposed to be studying today, it says, he is the exact replica, the exact radiance of, the, of God's glory. He is telling the truth about God. If you know, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. There is no difference between them. And his life, his perfect life, is the righteousness that he will work in us. He gives to us, imparts to us, and and will ultimately work in us. That's his promise. That's the new covenant. I will write my laws in your hearts and on your minds. That's his promise. That is the second new covenant. It is not about sacrifices. It's not about animals. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is. It's focusing not on the earthly, the symbols, but on the reality of the human soul. Boy, there's so much to cover. Um, so I believe that, yeah, 1844 was an emphasis on, on the sanctuary, but we have got to get the message right about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, there were good things in Hebrews. Good things about Hebrews. The only cleansing, if you read through the book of Hebrews, and I'd encourage you to read it, and read it in one or two sittings. You cannot pick a verse here and pick a verse there and really understand it. You'll just be totally lost, and you can get some really funny ideas. But if you read through it in its entirety, which I thank the, whoever's ideas were to talk, study the sanctuary, that they put this in there, that we would finish with the book of Hebrews. The only cleansing in the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews, of all places in the Bible, focuses on the sanctuary. It has the most stuff to do with the sanctuary than any other book in the Bible. So if you want to kind of understand the sanctuary, go to Hebrews. And if you want to understand it, go to Hebrews. The only cleansing in the whole book of Hebrews is references to it's cleansed by blood is our consciousness from dead works. That is the only cleansing that occurs in the whole book and it occurs several times in the book. The blood of Christ cleanses your consciousness, 
conscience from dead works. Or all things are cleansed with blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. In Hebrews 9, we are cleansed with blood, but the heavenly things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And there's better than the animal sacrifice, but with Christ's sacrifice. In Hebrews 10, having our hearts sprinkled clean. Again, referring it back to the earthly sanctuary, but the symbolism. Our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That's the only cleansing there is. It's not a cleansing of a building. And this idea of Jesus our mediator. And, and what's the picture? And the picture is like, well, Christ is up there pleading. Okay, well, who's he pleading to? Who needs to be pled to? What? Yes, exactly. When I grew up, it was always, he was pleading to God the Father. That was my picture of God. That Jesus was there pleading in front of God the Father, like, please accept Dave. He really means well. He's imperfect, but I'll make up for him. Is God for us or what? Yes, the whole Godhead is for us. He doesn't have to be pleading to the Father or to the Spirit for us. They already are on our side. Now, does he be, need to be pleading on, behalf, on our behalf because, because the angels don't quite believe? There's some uh, Ellen White references that, that say that's not true. In fact, the only pleading in Hebrews is to us. You go through the book of Hebrews, the only things in which there's pleading is to us. Today, except. It's only an appeal to us. We are the ones that are being pled to. For us to believe. For us to believe. So I think there's some good news from the sanctuary. But um, just remember these foundational principles. Whenever you're studying, these are the foundation things that you need to have firmly to be anchored into. Okay? You need to be anchored into this. God is love. First and primary, God is love. Second, the great controversy is about the character of God. You need to get that firmly in your brains. And who's telling the truth? Christ. Who's telling the lies? Lucifer. That all of the Godhead is for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Any teaching that pits one against the other or tries to convince one versus the other is false. Heresy. Not the gospel. So is there, has there been a suggestion made somewhere that, that one is somehow not against us or needs to be cajoled into being on our side? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, sometimes that's taught. The third, the sanctuary is where God dwells. Either in individuals or collectively as a body or in heaven or wherever else God dwells. That blood represents life. And in the sanctuary, it represented the life of Christ. And it is the blood or the life that cleanses. It does not carry sins. The sanctuary was not desecrated by blood taken into the sanctuary. It might have dirtied it up a little bit, but it was not symbolic for carrying sins. It was symbolic for cleaning and cleansing. And what God wants most of all, out of everything that he's been doing, is he wants to be reconciled and have us restored to a relationship with him. That's what he wants. He wants the relationship that was broken in Eden to be restored and to, to come back to what he had originally designed. Just doing the rituals 
thinking that they are our means to salvation, are the dead works. They are the old covenant. Doing God's will, I have come to do thy will, O God. His law written on our hearts and on our minds, that we are then his people and he is our God, that is the new covenant. And that he has promised by giving his life that he will do. He will accomplish that. That, to me, is the good news from the sanctuary. That there's been a way made for us to be reconciled to God. And that God will be the one who makes us like himself. I mean, that's the good news. That he, he wants, I mean, the, the, the temptation for Adam, for Eve was, you will be like God. And that wasn't so bad. God wants to make us like himself. He wants to make us like him. He wants to be indwelling in us as sanctuaries. He will be the one that cleanses us. He will, he will be the one that writes these laws on our minds and hearts. And he has the plan to finally eliminate all of sin from this universe, from us individually, us collectively, and throughout the whole universe, to bring at one or atonement back to the universe again. So it is we that need to be cleansed from the lies about God and from the sins that result and be made back into the image of God. This is the part that we need to play. We need to yield ourselves, submit ourselves to be sanctuaries for the Holy Spirit, to place ourselves you know, as patients under the great physician and become part of a greater holy building that God wants to have on this earth to give a message, a good, the, the good news about God. The good news about God. And I hope we can get that. As we start a new year, that's what we need to be about. Hebrews is interesting because Hebrews is all about hanging in there. Hanging in there. Hanging in there knowing that you know, it, it's faith is the, what, the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. I mean, that new covenant, that, 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 that promise that God has said that, you know, he will write his laws on our hearts, that we will, you know, our own thinking will be in conformity to his will. It would be doing exactly what he would do. That's a promise that he's given. That's a wonderful promise. Wouldn't you want to be like that? I mean, I do. I want to be like God. I want to be that everything that I do and say would be exactly what God would do. And that's a, he has promised that he will do that. He has given, he staked his life on it. And it goes through the, Hebrews 11, all of those who, who by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, they never received what was promised, but they, they lived and they died in that faith, in that promise, in that hope of another world, of another place, a better place. And so as we start a new year soon, we're going to have tough times in 2014. If you think 2013 was bad, get ready for 2014. It's not going to get any better. And the message is the same. The patience of the saints. We need to hang in there with God, no matter what happens. And I didn't get a chance to... There, there's a very interesting thing. I want you to look at those things. Daniel 8.14, it's interesting, there's a thing, in, a statement by Ellen White, that four verses are, refer to the same thing. Daniel 7, where Christ comes to the Ancient of Days in the court. Daniel 8.14, then after 2300 days, the sanctuary will be set right or restored. Malachi 3, which talks about God refining, purifying. And Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Ellen White says those four passages of Scripture refer to the same thing. 
That is awesome. So if you're trying to figure out what's what, put those four, go and study those four ch- sections of scripture and then come with a whole understanding of, of, of all of those because each individually will contribute to the whole. We didn't have time to go through that, but I would recommend that for your study. Malachi 3, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Matthew 25, the parable of the ten She says those all refer to the same thing. That will enrich your study and understanding. I guarantee you, when you look at that, and it was no then accident, that in 1844, there was a big disappointment. There was a delay. It was, she says they refer to the same thing. All right? So I recommend that to you for your study. It will be very helpful to you. But we need to hang in there with God. I mean, that's the message I say, hang in there with God. You can only hang in there with God if you spend time with him, you're into his word, you're reading what he's saying, you're... you're asking for the Holy Spirit to guide you, to change you, to mold you, to inspire you, to do whatever he needs to do with you and to use you for that day, and you'll be blessed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you so much for the teachings and the truths that you're trying to teach us that really apply to us, and may we submit ourselves to you. You want to dwell within us. You want us to be your sanctuaries. You want to mold us and make us as individuals into collectively into another spiritual house. And that we will be part of that priesthood of believers that help to minister for you on this earth. Help us to have the good news about you. Have us, have us to be truly grounded in the truths about your character so that we might give good news to those that we meet. May we be able to help counteract the lies that Satan has lodged against you. That may, may, may we see you as a God of love and that all of you, the whole Trinity and even all of the heavenly beings are now for us. That you've rendered judgment in favor of the saints and that we are under your blessings. May we submit ourselves and yield ourselves to be your temples. And may we keep that way open. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave us the truth about you and whose life cleans us and cleanses us. That life that we may have integrated within our lives to change us and that we may reflect your image in the way that you have made us from the beginning. We praise you and thank you for that promise that you will do that. In Jesus' name, amen.